Welcome to lecture 34 of the course on high performance computing. You will recall that in the previous lecture we looked in some detail at different techniques for identifying the important parts of our program using tools called profilers and we move into a new topic in today's lecture. But let me just recap quickly to give you uh, some perspective on where we are right now. The objective of the various things that we are hearing about in this course is for us to understand what happens in the hardware and in the software when we run a program on a modern computer system. And in the previous class we learned about profiling, the techniques through which we can learn more about which are the important parts of our program from the perspective of concentrating our optimization efforts possibly only on those parts, maybe a small number of functions or small regions of the program, for example, important loops of the program which we might identify using basic block profiling of some kind. Now, in the previous topics of this course, we have looked at the hardware and the software through which the execution of programs is enabled on a computer system. And uh, um, in fact, at the time that we were looking at the different aspects of architecture, like the hardware which is involved in the execution of instructions or the hardware which is involved in remembering, you know, in other words, the memory and the cache, as well as the operating system and the software side of things, there were in fact a couple of problems which we did not address but which we will now have to take into account in order to progress further in our understanding of what happens when a program executes. So I'm going to just quickly talk about at least two of the problems that uh, we have not considered in the scheme of things that we were discussing until now. Okay, now one problem that in fact we did not talk about at all when we talked about uh, hardware was a problem with the kinds of memory that we are assuming are used in the construction of computer systems, in particular the silicon memory. Now you'll recall that the what I mean by the silicon memory is the, the memory circuits through which main memory is created or through which the cache memory is created and so on. And so we are talking here about circuits, electronic circuits that are capable of remembering things. And as we saw, they are, these are the circuits that are used to implement the, the registers within the CPU, whether they be general purpose registers or special purpose registers. They are also the circuits that are used to implement the RAM of the cache, the, the capacity to remember blocks of data within the cache. And further, they are the kinds of circuits that are used in the construction of main memories. <coughs> now, you will recall that we described the way that these circuits operate. I indicated that there are two main kinds of circuits and they differ in how they remember things. The one kind of circuit remembers by the state that the circuit is in. And at one point I had used the word flip-flop to refer to one possible implementation of a circuit to remember one bit of information. So the state that the circuit is in would determine whether a zero or a one is being remembered by the circuit. The other possibility was that a circuit could remember by the amount of charge, electric charge that is stored on a capacitor which is part of the circuit the more the charge possibly that could be interpreted as remembering a one. Less charge could be interpreted by the hardware as remembering a zero. So these are the two main ways in which the circuits remember, either by the state the circuit is in or by the amount of charge that is stored on a capacitor, which is part of the circuit. Now in both of these cases, the question that we didn't ask was what happens when the circuit is turned off or the computer system is turned off? And as it happens in both cases, the information is lost when the power source is turned off. So when you power down a computer, the contents of the registers are lost. The contents, all the data and instructions which have been remembered in the cache RAM are lost. And where the contents of the main memory are lost. When next you turn on the same computer, the contents that were there at the time of power down will no longer be present. That's what I mean by saying that the information is lost. So this is a problem which we had not talked about because until now it did not concern us but as you are going to see we are now going to start being concerned about this. This is a problem with the kind of silicon memory that we are assuming the computer system uses to build its registers, cache and main memory. So that is one aspect of the problem. Another aspect of the problem is the whole idea of how we expect programs to execute on a computer system. So we understand that when we type a dot out in response to the shell prompt, the program will be loaded into memory and then will execute. And when the program is in memory, it runs as a process. So the instructions of the pro a process is an operating system abstraction. But when there is an active process which is running, instructions of that process are executed on the CPU. And the data of that process may enter the registers of the CPU and get manipulated and so on. But the main uh, state information about the process is actually stored in memory 
And we talked about the memory image of the process as being made up of its text, which is the instructions comprising the program, of, of which that process is an execution, the data, the stack, and the heap, the different kinds of data with different lifetimes that are associated with the execution of the program that is represented by that process. So the memory image of the process was an integral attribute of the program in execution. When the values of variables change, they are reflected in the change in the values of the variables within that memory image. Now once again, the question that we didn't ask is, what happens when the program finishes execution? In other words, the a.out program has finished execution and it co had computed various pieces of information, various kinds of data, and the data could be in the text, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the data could be in the data segment or the stack or the heap, but when the program finishes execution, suddenly all that data ceases to exist. So all the instructions, the data, the stack and the heap, which were in memory when the program was executing, disappear when the program finishes executing. And this is, requires us to relook at our discussion of the lifetime of data. Because very clearly the execution models that we have been talking about up to now uh, are leaving something out. So let me just remind you that when we talked about the lifetime of data, we looked at three possibilities. One was that there could be pieces of data which came into existence when the program starts execution and which cease to exist when the program finishes execution. And that's why we would talk about the lifetime of such a piece of data as the execution time of the program. And you could imagine that if you had a program in which there was a, a global variable x which was declared, then this variable x would come into existence when the program starts executing and would cease to exist when the program finishes executing. And this uh, variable x might be implemented in the data segment, the data part of the memory image of the, pro of the representing the process. So this is one possibility about lifetime. The second possibility about lifetime that we saw was there could be pieces of data whose lifetime was the time between their explicit creation and their explicit deletion. And we know here that we're talking about dynamically created pieces of data and they may, be, they may come into existence because the program executes a function such as malloc, memory alloc, through which uh, a variable is created in memory, in the heap region of memory, and is associated with a pointer that points at it through which the program can refer to that piece of data. So this was the second possibility and relates to dynamically allocated variables which would be handled in the heap part of the memory image. The third possibility of lifetime that we saw was that there could be a piece of data which comes into existence when a function is called and ceases to exist when the function re call returns. And we saw that such variables would be, uh, could be local variables of the function, they could be the parameters of the function, could even be the return value of the function depending on how, you, how tightly you look at this definition of lifetime. But in all, all these cases, it would be uh, the model that we understood was one where these data with this, this kind of a lifetime would be allocated on the stack region of memory and therefore the stack would grow and shrink as functions called and were and returned. So all three of these are, and these were the only three lifetimes for data that we talked about, in all, in all three cases, the, the best that one could expect is that the lifetime of a piece of, da of data could be the entire execution time of the program. This relates back to the previous slide that we had, where we had explicitly said that this is a problem, this seems to be restrictive. You cannot have data that survives after the program finishes executing. And the lifetimes that we had seen up to now were clearly of that kind. The largest possible lifetime was the execution time of a program. We clearly need to be talking about a, lo a longer lifetime than this because there must be situations where we want to have data that exists after the program has, ceased, has finished execution. So I'm going to add a fourth possible lifetime. And the fourth possible lifetime is of data which continues to exist beyond the execution time of the program. So the data may have existed before the program started executing the data may have been used by the program when it was executing, but the data may continue to exist even after the program has finished executing. And in fact, I will go even further and say the data might even continue to exist if the power fails while the program is running. This is an even stronger constraint. You'll note that talking about the program or the data continuing to exist when the program has finished executing is one thing, but to talk about data which might continue to exist even if by accident the program does not finish executing completely, but rather the computer goes down when the program is in execution is an even stronger requirement, which is very clearly not going to be possible if we're talking about using the kinds of silicon memory that we were talking about up to now. So for the first time, we're talking about a class of data whose lifetime requires 
that something other than silicon be memory be used for the storage of, the, of such data, which is a whole new class of uh, data, which is why we are clearly moving into a new topic. And the name of the topic, is, uh, item number eight in our agenda, is what is referred to as file systems. So we've all used, uh, you've all used files. I've even referred to the file system calls when we talked about system calls. And we, can all, we all have a rough idea of what a file is. But let me just go ahead and say that a file is storage associated with data that continues to exist beyond the lifetime of the program that may have created it or the lifetime of a program that may have used that particular piece of data. So the file ad directly addresses the problems that we had identified in the previous few slides. So files uh, essentially exist to allow data to, ex to, to, to live beyond the lifetime of a program. And what we mean by the lifetime of a program is the execution time of the program. Right? So the data will continue to exist after the program has finished executing. Now another word or a, a word which is relevant in connection with such data is to refer to the data as persistent in that the data continues to exist or persists beyond the execution time of the program that may have created that piece of data. In order to have such persistent data, we are very clearly going to have something other than silicon memory, some form of storage which continues to be able to store or to remember things beyond the execution time of a single program. And if you think about the different kinds of storage that we saw, the only form of storage which has this property is what we called secondary storage. We talked about main memory, which was primary storage. We talked about various other silicon memory. But here, very clearly, we have to be talking about non-silicon memory, which was, in general, what we were including in the, our class of secondary storage devices, which we, in some sense, were including under the I.O. devices in our list of hardware. Now, and I've introduced another term in addition to persistent in, identif in talking about secondary storage devices, and that is to talk of them as non-volatile. And that, too, has this uh, implication of uh, volatility is the implication of ceasing to exist or being temporary in nature, non-volatile has the implication of being something which is of a more long-lasting or persistent nature. So these terms non-volatile and persistent would both characterize the kind of storage devices that clearly must be used for the storage of data that has to exist beyond the lifetime of a program, the execution time of a program. So in, in, in other words, I could actually define or explain what a file is as an alternative to describing a file as the storage for data that continues to exist beyond the execution time of a program. Knowing that such data could only be stored on a secondary storage device or a non-volatile persistent storage device, I could say that, and I know an example of such a storage device, the hard disk is an example, but I could then go ahead and say that a file is a, a collection of data on such a persistent storage device. So I could, in answer to the question, what is a file, an alternative answer, the answer number two might be a collection of data on a persistent storage device. I have added one more uh, requirement of a file, and that is that a file must have a name. Because it's only if, if the file, if the, if the st data which is stored on the persistent storage device, such as the disk, it's only if that uh, and collection of data has a name that it can be referred to by a program. And remember, we are talking here about data which can be used by a program. Hence, I've added the requirement that a file must have a name associated with it. In the absence of a name, a program would not be able to refer to the data on the disk. So we have this understanding of what a file is. And let's just take another look at secondary storage. We're going to look at secondary storage in a little bit more detail. Now today, <coughs> there are three main kinds of secondary storage. The first kind of secondary storage <coughs> is persistent and non-volatile, but the way that it stores information is through properties of magnetic media. So these are typically referred to as magnetic storage devices. The second kind of secondary storage device remembers or stores information by the optical properties of certain devices. And hence, they are referred to as optical storage or optical secondary storage devices. And the third, which I don't know if I have talked about in much detail before, is what is known as flash secondary storage. And here, what we actually have is something which is a form of silicon uh, memory, but special in that even though it is a silicon memory, it continues to be able to retain the information that is stored in it well beyond the power source has been disconnected. 
and that is because it has a very slow rate of leakage of the charge or of the information that is stored in the silicon memory. So flash is something like the silicon memory that we talked about but special in that it is very carefully designed so that the information dissipates from it or leaks away from it at an extremely slow rate when the power source is switched off and therefore one can still think of the flash memory as being persistent or non-volatile. The information continues to exist after the power source has been removed from the flash device. And we saw examples of magnetic storage. I talked about the hard disk drive. Every computer system, most computer systems that you have dealt with have a hard disk drive. In the not too distant past, a very popular form of uh, storage was the floppy disk. One would carry floppy disk containing one's program or data, insert it into the floppy disk drive in the computer system from which information could be read, files could be read. And uh, even today, people sometimes use magnetic tape cartridges, which are long reels of magnetic material on a tape. So once again, the storage is done by the magnetic state of the magnetic uh, the state of magnetic information stored on the device in all three cases. We've also seen some examples of optical secondary storage devices, the compact disc, the VCD, the DVD. These are all forms of the, these are all secondary storage devices, non-volatile, persistent, in which the information is stored through some optical property of the medium. Finally, flash also is something you would have encountered before. Many of you use memory sticks. Many of you use uh, uh, MP3 players which contain no hard disk. They don't, the, the MP3 player that you have clearly does not have a hard disk or an optical storage device, but rather it remembers the music or other pieces of information that you have stored on it on a flash secondary storage device. So these are all examples of things that we have seen before. And in fact, all or e any one of these could be used for the storage of files. Now, as it happens, for the most of the computer systems that you will be using today, the file system would typically be, or at least one of the file systems that you would have access to would typically be on a hard disk. Though it is certainly possible that you could have files stored on floppy disks or magnetic tape cartridges, and you could certainly have CDs and DVDs and VCDs containing files that you could insert into the system and read the files from. And the same is true of memory sticks. But an important part is played by the file systems which are provided on hard disks in the computer, many of the computer systems that you will deal with today. Both desktops and many of the laptops still use hard disks. So I'm going to concentrate a little bit more and talk about the, the characteristics of a disk drive, a hard disk. So <coughs> we're going to look at the properties of magnetic hard disks. Now, if, if one was to open a hard disk and look inside, one would see that the magnetic uh, material is actually coated onto a surface uh, of something called a platter. And uh, this is the, the surface from which the word disk comes. The, the word disk is actually just referring to a circular flat uh, object. Right? And uh, basically the magnetic disk contains such disks and the technical term which is given for each of those disks is to refer to it as a platter. So uh, there is a platter which is covered with magnetic material and the information, the data or the instructions that are to be stored in the file are actually stored on in the magnetic, by the magnetic state of the coating on the, on the platter. Now one key piece of information about the platter is that it is rotating. And, uh, Therefore, when we think about a platter, one could have, and I'm, if I was viewing, I broke open a hard disk and I viewed the platter from the top, what I would see would be a circular disk. And I'm showing you the circular disk over here. We're looking at, at it from the top. Now it is rotating, therefore it would also be beneficial for us to look at it from the side. But for the moment, we just think of it as a hard disk. I'm looking at the platter from the top. So this, this is the platter and it has a magnetic coating on it, which is what I'm showing by this yellow color. Now if I looked at it from the side, this once again is the hard disk platter looked at from the side. Recall that it is rotating, which means that it must be rotating around its, I had showed you the, the center of the, of the disk. So very clearly when one looks at it from the side and if this disk is rotating, if this platter is rotating, it must be rotating on a spindle, an, on an axis of some kind. And that is what I show in this diagram. We're looking at the platter from the side now. And I'm also showing you the spindle on which the disk is rotating. So the spindle on which it is rotating, and I'm also showing the direction in which it is rotating. Okay, now the, in a 
a typical disk today, it might be interesting to note how fast the disk is rotating. And we, at this point, it's not clear why the disk is rotating at all uh, from the discussion that we've had so far. But let me just mention that a typical disk today, the, the, the speed of rotation of the disk could be something like 15,000 revolutions per minute. Right? Some, some disks may operate at 10,000 revolutions per minute, but there are disks today which rotate at 15,000 revolutions per minute. So in every minute, they are rotating 15,000 times, which means that these are rotating at a fairly high speed. Right? And in order to do this rotation, as we had learned earlier, they have, must have motors. So there are many mechanical devices in the hard disk, unlike the silicon memories and the CPUs that we saw up to now, where there were no mechanical devices. The hard disk certainly has many mechanical devices, such as the, the motor. Motor is electrical in nature, but it d does this movement, which is why I refer to it as a mechanical device. Okay, now, so much for the platter. Now, we know that the, I'm once again showing you the top view of a platter. We've, we're looking at the inside of what's inside the hard disk. So the, the platter is coated with the magnetic material, but the magnetic material is not just painted on top, but rather has some structure to it. And one can talk about the different uh, concentric coatings of magnetic material across the surface of the platter by the word track. So a track is one concentric circular recording surface on a platter. For example, here I'm showing you the outermost track of this particular platter. So there's one track of information, and there could be tracks of information internal to that. Right? In, this in this particular example, I'm showing you about five tracks along on, on, this, on this particular surface. For a real disk drive today, the number of tracks could be tens of thousands, 20,000, 30,000, or 40,000 tracks. So the number of concentric circles of magnetic material on a single platter is on the order of a few tens of thousands. I'm unable to draw 10,000 or 30,000 concentric circles on this. So I'm just showing you five for, for purposes of example. So th we understand that the word track is referring to any one of these concentric coatings of um, magnetic material. So I could talk about the innermost track of this platter, and I could refer to the outermost track of this platter. And you could observe that the number, the amount of information that could be stored on the outermost track is likely to be more than the amount of information that could be stored on the innermost track, because the innermost track has less area than the outermost track, if one makes assumptions. But one could also imagine that there could be some variations on how the layout of the disk is done, I mean, in addition to this basic framework. Okay, now, the next thing that we need to understand is that each of the tracks on a particular platter of a hard disk contains units of information that can be read from the hard disk. And the basic unit of information that can be read or written from the hard disk is not one entire track, but a unit, a portion of a track, which is referred to as a sector or a block. So a sector or block is a unit of track that is read or written at a time from the disk. So for, for ease of illustration, I'm going to show you sectors as being radially uh, oriented on this, on this on the surface of, of the disk. So for example, this region of, of that particular, uh, the second uh, track on, from the outside on this disk, I'm, I have shaded a particular region of the track which might be what I'll refer to as a sector. So you'll notice that on any one track, there are many sectors. And the sector is the basic unit in which one can read or write from a hard disk. Now, I've used the word sector, I've also used the word block, and uh, currently the word sector is more often used to refer to this unit of read or write from a hard disk. People talk about a disk sector, but it is still the case that people will sometimes refer to this by the word block. I have used the word block in connection with cache memories, therefore it would be a little bit confusing, but in the current discussion, when we're talking about file systems, whenever we hear the word block, I just understand that it is meant to be synonymous with the word sector. And if necessary, we can qualify it by talking about this as a disk block or a disk sector. Okay, now the question that will come to mind at this point is, I've told you that the number of tracks on a, on a typical disk today is a few tens of thousands, but the basic unit of reading or writing information from the disk is not a track. It is, on the other hand, a, a disk sector. So you will ask, how big is a sector on a typical disk today? 
And the number which we could use in connection with this could be something like 512 bytes. Right? Until not too long ago, 512 bytes was a typical disk sector size. In some cases, it may have been about 1 kilobyte. But increasingly, it has been the case that the, the, the size, the basic unit of information that can be read off a hard disk, the, the benefit of having slightly larger sectors is that from a single read from the hard disk, one can get more information if the sector size is more. So increasingly, the trend has been towards having um, sector sizes that are larger than 512 bytes. In fact, uh, there is a move to have some kind of a standardization through which 4 kilobytes will become uh, a typical sector size in, in a year or two. But for the purposes of uh, our discussion of file systems today, I will use examples of something like 512 bytes or maybe 1 kilobyte as a typical disk uh, sector size. So essentially we understand that in a single read from the disk, one can get one sector of information. Okay, so, so much for uh, our understanding of the disk. We understand that the disk, if we break it open, has information which is stored on me me metallic, flat metallic surfaces, circular surfaces called uh, Tra uh, co called platters. The platter is coated with magnetic material in concentric circles called tracks. And each track is broken up into individual units called sectors, where a sector or, or block is the basic unit of read or write from the disk. Okay, now in order to do the read or the write, there will be a need for a device which can read or write the current contents of a particular sector. And the name given to the piece of uh, me uh, the mechanism that can do the reading or writing from a sector is to refer to it as a read or write head. So what is a read or write head? Very clearly it must be in a, a, a magnetic or an electromagnetic device. And in fact it is an electromagnet that can be, that can either read or modify a sector from a hard disk. So associated with the hard disk there must be these read or write heads which through which one can read or write information to or from the hard disk. So let us suppose that I have for this particular sector, I have uh, one particular read write head which is currently located, th this brown object which is currently over the platter. Then uh, the thing to remember here is this platter is rotating. Remember that it is rotating on an axis which is perpendicular to, we are looking at, we are currently looking at the platter from the top. And if I had looked at it from the side view, I would have noticed the platter sticking up. But now this platter is rotating in, uh, in some particular direction. For example, um, it could be rotating in, in, in the clockwise or the counterclockwise direction. But the read write head, if there is only one read write head for this entire platter, then there will be a need for this read write head to be able to move in and out. And therefore, one would expect that it would be attached to some kind of a mechanical device, which I will refer to as the arm, and that the arm can be caused to move in or out so that the read write head could be placed over any one of the different. Uh, tracks associated with the hard disk. So if I move the read write head into its innermost position, then it could be used to read from the innermost track. If I move the read write head to the outermost position, then it could be used to read from the outermost track. And coupled with the fact that this platter is rotating, remember that the platter is rotating. In this particular example, I'm assuming the platter is rotating in the counterclockwise direction. Then it's enough if the uh, if the arm can just move in and out. There's no need for the arm to have to move radially. It just has to, I'm sorry, it just has to move in and out along this one radius. It doesn't have to move up or down. So the arm has to move in or out to be over the correct uh, track. And then with the rotation of the disk, sooner or later, the correct track will come under the read write, the correct sector will come under the read write arm, the read write head. So in units of, of a sector, in other words, 512 bytes, let us say, information can be read off the disk or could be written into the disk through this device called the read write arm, uh, read write head which is mounted on an arm. Okay, now the next uh, va variable that we have to understand is that a typical disk today does not contain only one platter but actually contains multiple platters all rotating together on a common spindle. In other words, the picture that we had in mind up to now was that there was a spindle which is rotating and attached to that is the platter which we are now looking at from the side view. But in reality, the disks of today, even the disk in your uh, per personal computer or your laptop, has multiple platters. So there could be, as in this example where we have seven platters, all rotating on a single uh, spindle. 
what is the advantage of doing this? The amount of information that can be stored on this uh, disk is now many times what would have been possible with only one platter. Further, it is possible that we could have magnetic coatings not only on the top surface of each platter, but also on the bottom surface of each platter. So, rather than thinking of the capacity of a disk as being determined by, uh, the, 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 by only the number of platters in terms of one surface per platter, we, are, we understand clearly that there could be two magnetic coatings on each platter. What does it mean if we have two magnetic coatings on each platter? So, there is a magnetic coating on the bottom of this platter, there is also a magnetic coating on the uh, on the top of this platter, there is also a magnetic coating on the bottom of the platter. But very clearly, I will need a separate read write head for each of the surfaces. So, I will, there, will, there will be a need not for one read write head for each platter, but for one read write head for each surface. So, I will need one read write head for the upper surface of the uh, topmost platter, another one for the lower surface of the topmost platter, and so on. So, associated with uh, such a disk in which there are multiple platters, there will have to be a separate read write head for each surface, not for each platter. And on the left over here, I have shown you for, for, for this example how many read write heads might be needed. You notice that there is one for the uppermost surface, one for the lowermost surface of the upper platter. Similarly, for each of the platters, there are two read write heads for a total of 14 read write heads. I am indicating the read write heads by these small brown boxes towards the outermost uh, side of the platters. Now, you will also notice if you look very carefully at this diagram that I am showing the read write heads as not being in contact with the platter, but slightly above the platter. And this may be an important consideration. You will remember that the platters are rotating at fairly high speeds, possibly 1500 revolutions per minute. And therefore, if the read write head was actually in contact with the platter, very soon the magnetic coating would get scraped off. So, obviously, there would be a need to have a sufficient gap between the read write head and the platter so that the reading or writing can happen to the electromagnetic properties, but it should not wear away this, the magnetic coating of the disk. Hence, I show a small gap. Now, we had talked in the when we first learned about the read write head, I had talked about the need to mount the read write head on an arm which could move in or out to allow the reading or writing to be done for any of the tracks of a particular platter. Now, we now have a need to have one arm for each of these 14 in this example um, read write heads. So, I show 14 of those arms and this raises a few possibilities. It could be possible to have a disk in which each of the arms could independently move in or out, but that would make the design of the disk somewhat more complicated than if I had um, a single movement of all the read write arms together, which is what I am going to assume in this case. So, I am going to assume that all the heads are connected to a single actuator. In other words, all the read write arms are actually connected together as I show in the leftmost side. So, this connection among all the read write arms is what I am going to refer to as something that is moved in or out by a motor, which is what the actuator term comes in. So, the general idea here is going to be that we will assume that all of the read write arms move in or out together. Therefore, there is only a single motor involved in that motion and the alternative would have been uh, the complication of a separate motor and separate control for each of the read write arms for each of the surfaces, which would have added to the complexity. Therefore, the power consumption and the noise made by the hard disk and so on. So, this seems like a, a more pal palatable assumption. Right? So, this is the picture that we have in mind. If you look at the current situation of this particular disk that I am showing, the situation is that the actuator is in such a condition that the, all the read write heads for all the surfaces are at the leftmost extent of the disk. Now, if I had looked at this from the top rather than from the side, this is what the diagram would look like. You notice that in the, in the, in the side view, the read write arms are on the outer side of the disks and therefore, if one looked at the top view, in the top view I see only the read write head of the uppermost surface. That is what the top view will show me and I see that the, the read write head is over the outermost track. And if the actuator had moved in, in fact, uh, I will now introduce the term cylinder. So, in the current situation, you will note that the read write head for the out, uh, uppermost surface is over its outermost track. And the same will be true for each of the surfaces of this particular read write of this particular disk. Right? The its read write head for any one of the surfaces, its read write head will be over its outermost track. Therefore, we could actually have a term for 
the outermost tracks of all the surfaces within this particular hard disk and that is what the term cylinder is used for. So all the tracks associated with a given actuator position, in other words the corresponding track from each of the surfaces of all the platters within the hard disk for a given position of the actuator is what we refer to as a cylinder. And the term cylinder makes, seems to make some sense because if you remember that um, from the side view we are referring to a track as being a circle then when I have this collection of circles one on top of the other, a collection of circles one on top of the other like this, when viewed from the side it is actually going to look like a cylinder, hence the name cylinder, to refer to the collection of all the tracks from all the surfaces associated with one actuator position. Okay, now uh, um, just uh, as, a, as a brief aside, here we are talking about hard disks, but uh, one could remember as I mentioned that there were and there still are certain other kinds of secondary storage devices called floppy disks and some of you may even have used floppy disks. As the name suggests, a floppy disk is floppy in that it is not firm. We talked about the hard disk as having a platter made of metal. A floppy disk is not too dissimilar, the only difference is that its platter is not made of metal but of some thin plastic material which is coated with magnetic, uh, ma a magnetic coating. So the principle of operation of the floppy disk is similar to that of the hard disk other than the fact that it is not a firm surface but has a thin surface which is pliable and hence the word floppy. And in, the, in floppy disks too one had this possibility of having a floppy disk which has a magnetic coating both on its upper surface and on its lower surface but there isn't really the possibility of having many floppy, many floppy platters in a single floppy drive because of the fact that it is not a very firm surface. Therefore, one cannot have read write heads that sit uh, a little away from the, each of the different surfaces. So the floppy disk was somewhat restricted in its capacity and its capabilities but was pleasant in that because of its uh, floppy nature and the low cost of the materials used to conduct, uh, to, to construct it, it is possible to have floppy disks available at a very low cost. Okay, so that was just an aside about floppy disks. We are currently still interested in hard disks. So we have understood that there are platters with multiple surfaces, uh, two surfaces per platter there are tracks and sectors and bl or blocks where the information is stored and this concept of read write heads and cylinders. Okay, now moving ahead, for any particular position of the actuator, for example in this diagram the actuator is in such a, the actuator is such that the read write heads are over the outermost track of each surface. Now what if the actuator was moved, the, the, the disk was activated so that the movement of the read write heads went so that all the read write heads were over the innermost track. Then in other words if the actuator then moves the heads in completely then the diagram would look like this. Remember that in the previous situation the read write heads were over the edge, the outer edge of the side view but if the actuator moves everything in then the read write heads will be over the innermost part but just, just off the spindle and in the upper view we would actually notice that the each read write head was over the innermost track and that would be referring to now as the innermost cylinder. So I can talk about the innermost cylinder and I could talk about the outermost cylinder. Right? So in the current diagram the current cylinder is the innermost track of each surface. Okay, now with this understanding about uh, what is happening inside the disk and some additional information about the, the, the floppy we can ask some other questions about disks. One imp important question is and this is a question that we had approximate answers to earlier without a proper understanding of what was happening inside the hard disk but the question of how long does it take to actually read or write a disk sector. We know that the size of a disk sector could be 512 bytes or 1 kilobytes but it, that is the unit of read or write from a hard disk and the question is how long does it take to read or write from a hard disk of the kind that we, are, that we are currently talking about. Okay, now given our understanding of how the hard disk is constructed, we can work out the various steps that may have to take place in order to read information out of a hard disk. Now how does this uh, requirement to read information from a hard disk arise? It arises because a program made a request through which it became necessary to read from a hard disk. For example, we are talking now about file systems, so it is possible that a program did a read operation on a file as a result of which it became necessary to read from a hard disk. So all of this is going to be initiated by program behavior. 
Okay, now the piece of information that is required from the hard disk is going to be available in some particular sector and therefore there must be some notion of a sector address. Right? So we are talking about reading a particular sector, maybe sector number 1000 of a hard disk. Okay, now one thing which will certainly have to happen is that the read write arms will have to be moved into such a position so that they are over the current, the correct cylinder as far as the sector of interest is concerned. For example, if the particular block that I, this particular sector that is required by the program is on the outermost track of one, a particular surface of the hard disk, then the one thing which will have to happen is that the read write arms will have to be moved so that they are over the outermost cylinder of the hard disk. On the other hand, if the sector that is required is on the innermost track, then the read write arm would have to be moved by the actuator until it is over the innermost cylinder of the hard disk. Now the amount of time that it takes to move the read write arms so that they are positioned over the correct cylinder or track is what is referred to as the seek latency. The operation of moving the read write arms is what is referred to as seeking. And therefore one, one, one component of the amount of time to read a sector out of the hard disk is the seek time. And this is basically the time for the actuator or to move the disk arms to be over the correct cylinder. And one knows the correct cylinder based on which disk sector is required by the current read write access. Now once the read write arms are positioned over the correct cylinder, one has to of course wait for the correct sector to come under the read write arms. Remember from our diagram that it's not enough for the read, the read write head to be over the correct cylinder. It could well be that the sector that we're interested in is a sector which is not currently under the read write arm. But that as the disk rotates sooner or later, that particular sector will come under the read write head. So the second component of the amount of time that it takes to read from a disk, to read a sector from a disk block is what I'll refer to as rotational latency. And this is the amount of time that it takes for the correct sector to rotate to, and become under the read write head. Right? So this is the second component of the amount of time that it takes to access, to, uh, to read or write a, a, a disk sector. Now once both of the, once the seeking has been done and the rotation has been done, then we're in a condition where the read write head can actually read or write information to or from the disk. The next question is how much time does it take to transfer the information that has been read by the read write arm into the memory, which is where the data was supposed to be read to, or to transfer the information from the disk into the computer, the, the processor. And this is what is, I will refer to as the transfer time. The time for the data to be transferred from the hard disk to the computer system, maybe to the main memory. Okay, and this also has to be viewed as part of the read write time for the disk. So I'll add it as a third component. Now there is a fourth possible component and uh, let me first motivate uh, the component before putting its name up. Now the, you will notice that these disks, the way we have described them, are fairly complicated electromagnetic and mechanical entities. And uh, in co computer systems of today where it is important to try to keep the amount of power or consumed by the computer as low as possible or the amount of heat generated by the computer as low as possible, in the interests of uh, environmental reasons and keeping the cost of running the computer down, it may occasionally be necessary for the disk to be powered down. For example, if you consider that there is a situation where there has been no disk activity for a significant amount of time, then instead of the disk continuing to rotate, the disk rotation could actually be seized. And subsequently, if there is a need to access the disk, the disk could be rotated again. So in, in order to cons conserve the amount of power consumed by a disk, there may be a need to have a low power mode of operation of the disk in which possibly it is not rotating. So if the disk is currently in a low power mode of operation and that is when the request to read or write from the disk happens, then there may be the need for some startup time in order to get the disk rotating. So I'll add that as a possible fourth component to the amount of time that it takes to read or write from a disk sector. And that I'll just write it as the disk may currently be in a low power consumption mode, possibly not spinning, in which case it may take some time for it to come back into a mode from which the read or write of the data from the disk can be done. So these are four of the components, four main components of how much time it takes to read or write from a hard disk, to read a sector from a hard disk. Next we need to have some idea about what, what, what each of these uh, individual components is actually means in terms of seconds or milliseconds or microseconds.
Now let me just uh, put some numbers down and then we will try to understand uh, where these are coming from. Now first of all we have put the typical seek latency as being something in the nature of 5 to 10 milliseconds and how do we understand this? We understand that the, the basically the activity involved in seeking is moving the read write arms from wherever the read write arms are currently located until they are over the correct cylinder associated with the request that has been made, the read write, the sector that has to be read. And this will involve a motor moving the, actu the actuator mechanism through which a motor will actually have to move the read write arms in or out. And depending on how far away the cylinder is from the current location, the required cylinder is from the current location of the read write arms, the amount of time that it will take will differ. Therefore when, when one is given a number like this, one is obviously being given an average number, not a typical number but an average number. And the kind of average number which is usually used is a number which is given based on the amount of time that it takes to move the read write heads by about one third of the width, the radius of the, of the cylinder. So about one third of the distance from the outermost to the innermost track is considered as the norm for reporting a typical a seek time. So the typical seek, seek times we are told are on the order of 5 to 10 milliseconds for hard disks today. And this would clearly have something to do with the number of cylinders as well as the speed with which the read write arms can be moved in or out from possibly either from a resting position or from a moving position. Okay, now the next number that we have is that the rotational latency can be expected to be 2 to 3 milliseconds and this number was calculated based on a 15,000 RPM disk. In other words, a disk that is rotating at 15,000 revolutions per minute. And where could this number come from? Once again, we are clearly being given some kind of an average based on, because you, you will understand that once again going back to our diagram, when the ro ro rotation happens, it is quite possible that the disk is, the read write head is actually o currently over the correct cylinder, in which case there will be no rotational latency. But it is possible that the read write head is completely away from where it should be and that it has to rotate almost a full rotation until the read write head is over the correct uh, sector. So there are many possibilities. So how does one come up with an average? And the answer is that the average that is typically computed is made under the assumption that you have to rotate about half the circumference of the, of the platter, in other words about half a rotation. So how does one calculate how much time it takes to do half a rotation, for example for a 15,000 RPM disk? Just use the definition of its rotational speed. This is a disk which is capable of revolving 15,000 times per minute, therefore to revolve uh, 15,000 times per minute. Therefore, in 60 seconds, it is able to do 15,000 revolutions and what I want to know is how much time does it, does it take to do one revolution, I am sorry, how much time does it take to do half a revolution and therefore, I will have to calculate half of the amount of time that it takes to, to do one revolution. So this was 60 seconds for 15,000 revolutions, therefore 60 divided by 15,000 seconds for one revolution multiplied by half to get the time for half a revolution. And uh, in terms of milliseconds, uh, you will notice that this is along the ballpark of what this number that we have over here. Therefore, for a disk with a slower rotational speed, this number would be higher. For a disk with higher rotational speed, this number would be lower. But that is a, uh, very clearly the rotational latency, average number, is related to the speed of rotation of the disk. What about the transfer time? Now, this obviously would refer to the speed with which or the rate at which information can be moved from the disk out of the disk. And we are given this number that it could happen at something like 15 to 30 megabytes per second. Now that is the rate at which the data can be transferred. In our particular question, we are asking how much time would it take to transfer one disk sector. And for ease of calculation, if I assume that we are talking about a disk sector as being of size 1 kilobyte, then I could calculate the transfer time. I want to know how much time it takes to transfer 1 kilobyte if it takes 30 if I can transfer information at the rate of 30 megabytes per second. And one can very easily see that the, the nature of the time here is going to be on the order of microseconds, right? Because we have kilo on the top and we have, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, well, it's going to be a, a low number in comparison with this 5 to 10 milliseconds that we have over here. But one can calculate the amount of time that it could take to transfer one disk sector, assuming some size for the six sec disk sector, such as one kilobyte, based on this transfer speed. So the kilo and the mega are different by about 10 power 3 and therefore if I remove the 10 power 3 I will get milliseconds over here. So about one thirtieth of a millisecond 
which is on the order of 30 microseconds, which is what I was talking about over here. So, ballpark we may be talking about a few tens of microseconds for the transfer. So, just going back, the seek latency on average could be 5 to 10 milliseconds, the rotational latency could be 2 to 3 milliseconds, and the transfer time could be a few tens of microseconds. Therefore, in some sense, one might say that the transfer time is negligible in comparison to the seek latency. The rotational latency itself is small compared to the seek latency and one might argue that the seek latency is what is going to dominate the read write time for a sector and that uh, therefore one could argue that the amount of time that it takes to read or write from a hard disk a single sector could be something like 5 to 10 and then you add 2 to 3 to that and come up with something like 7 to 13 or 7 to 13 milliseconds which is the kind of number that we had talked about earlier. I had loosely said that it takes a few milliseconds to read a sector from, to read from a hard disk. Now we have left out uh, one component for which there is a much larger time associated with it. I have suggested that if the disk is not spinning, then to actually get it into a mode from which the data, the, the seeking, the rotation and the latent transfer could actually occur may be tens or maybe even hundreds of milliseconds. And what this means is that we are getting closer to a single second, possibly a second as the total amount of time that it would take to do the entire disk access. But hopefully this is not the typical case, but it is going to happen rarely because if you have a computer system which, in which the disk is fairly active, then it would rarely go into this low power consumption mode and therefore the need to get it spinning and get it initialized would not happen very often. And therefore in talking about the typical amount of time to access a block or a sector out of disk, one, could, one would be forgiven if one just ignored the last component and concentrated on the seek and the rotational latency. The transfer time as we have seen is significantly smaller. Okay, with this we have a good understanding about what is happening inside the hard disk and just to distill out uh, one or two important lessons from this, we understood the structure of what is happening inside the hard disk and in effect we realized that seek and rotation are the two important components of time in accessing a component of a hard disk and that if the operating system is going to play a part in trying to improve the performance of the hard disk by some kind of scheduling mechanism, then either the seek or the rotation are the two uh, mechanisms of the disk which it may have to try to control. Now with this uh, introduction to file systems, the background of what is happening inside a hard disk, we will now be in a position in the next lecture to move ahead and try to talk about the functioning of a file system, how the files are actually located on such a hard disk, how the operating system helps to provide the files, the individual blocks or sectors of the file to a program when the program requests those, those a particular file uh, sector or block. And uh, fundamentally the background that we required from the hard disk has now been covered and in the lectures to come we will look at the file system from the perspective of the operating system, the key functionalities, the system calls associated with that and the impact on the execution time of our programs. Thank you. Thank you.